Um, as everyone has uh, now heard, uh, my name is Selena Leo. I am um, part of the Forensic Odontology team here in Australia, in Sydney. Um, I, uh, I need to start off, first of all, of course, by thanking very much the organisers of this conference. Uh, having organised conferences in the past, I know how challenging uh, something like this can be, especially um, now that they can come as an online form or a hybrid form. So my congratulations to all of those uh, involved in the organising team. Um, Dr. Rakesh has uh, very kindly introduced um, um, many of the uh, areas that I'm involved in in Australia, so I'm not going to run through those again. Although I do note that I uh, uh, omitted uh, mentioning that I, of course, am a very honoured member of the Indian Association of Forensic Odontology. Um, so um, that uh, seemed to have been left off my CV at the time. I'm going to start off by showing you the uh, new forensic medicine facility that we have in um, Sydney, uh, New South Wales, Australia. Um, as uh, Dr. Rakesh uh, had already mentioned, uh, this is the largest forensic medicine facility in Australia. Uh, and it was built to the tune of $92.5 million. Um, you can see here that the front section of the um, facility or the more public section um, was designed with a lot of air and a lot of light and a lot of glass um, because obviously this is the area that um, our grieving families um, are going to be in. There are quiet spaces. Um, spaces where families can consult with grief counsellors and of course we have spaces, uh, calm spaces where um, families can view uh, their loved ones and then towards the rear of this facility is where all of the all of the work happens I suppose. Uh, the uh, mortuary uh, is in the rear of this building plus obviously all the associated offices. Um, this is the uh, disaster centre of Sydney as well. Um, it, uh, the mortuary here is designed to take um, uh, up to a large aircraft um, uh, accident should it occur, um, so it can cope with all of that. Um, this facility is where most of the deceased in New South Wales uh, will come to. Um, approximately 95% of our deceased come here. So it's not unusual for our facility to process uh, in excess of 2,000 deceased persons in a week. Um, and obviously the uh, examinations are going to occur in our main mortuary and our forensic odontology has its own examination room um, so that we can conduct our examinations because, of course, because we do use radiology, um, it is important that we are in an area that um, can uh, include a radiation exclusion zone, uh, as most of you know um, already. Just to give you an idea, this is a map of Australia. You can see we're made up of six states and two territories. Um, and I am in New South Wales, which is the one coloured in red here. And I do live in the capital, still live and work in the capital city of Sydney here. To give you an idea, um, even though Australia is actually quite a large uh, land area, our population is only 20, just over 27 million. Um, and New South Wales is the largest state with a population of uh, about 8.2 million people. So I'm going to start off with some, some definitions, uh, first of all. Um, my apologies to those of my forensic odontology colleagues that may have heard some of these definitions. I think that um, most lectures try and start off with some sort of definition, so I thought I would get it out of the way now. Um, of course, I'm going to speak a little bit about Interpol and how forensic odontology um, appears in the Interpol scene. Um, and um, uh, so we start off, of course, Interpol is an abbreviation. Uh, it's it, The full name is the International Criminal Police Organisation. And it is what we call an intergovernmental organisation. So in other words, it works between governments rather than within governments. Now, forensic odontology itself, for those of our forensic scientist colleagues who aren't in the odontology field, um, it is certainly that branch of dentistry that is involved with the examination and evaluation of dental evidence. And like most forensic sciences, um, that evidence can then pre be presented in the interests of justice. 
So in essence, we are the overlap between the dental and legal professions. Now, of course, forensic odontology, certainly in the Interpol space, um, comes into play in the disaster victim identification uh, when we're talking about Interpol. Um, disaster, a disaster, of course, is defined as a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or society involving widespread human, material, economic or environmental losses or impacts, which exceeds the ability of the affected community or society to cope using its own resources. And of course, that's a, a very important point. That that second half is, of course, that um, the uh, the place where the disaster has occurred um, has uh, cannot cope with what um, uh, what it needs to do using its own resources. Now, Interpol uh, is usually a very big meeting. It's a uh, the Interpol Disaster Victim Identification Conference, as it is now called generally meets once a year, usually in late May. Um, this year, of course, due to COVID, the meeting was shifted. And so we met in late June, only a, a, about a month or so ago. Um, and unfortunately, due to the COVID restriction restrictions, um, we were also limited to the number of attendees that could participate. And so you can see here, the, um, the number was capped at 150 participants this year. Um, which is for those of my colleagues uh, in this meeting, uh, those who've attended this meeting before, know that this is really quite small for the DVI conference. Um, it's usually uh, very well attended. Um, so, but you know, like most of us who have finally come together after the last two years, it was great to be able to get to see uh, one another face to face. Um, and so this picture, of course, was taken in the uh, foyer area of the um, Interpol headquarters, which is located in Lyon, France. Now, let's talk a bit about Interpol itself. Interpol has 195 member countries. Um, and what Interpol does is they help the police in all of these countries to work together, hopefully to make the world a safer place. Now, to do this, Interpol enables these countries to share and access data on crimes and criminals and offer a range of technical and operational support. The General Secretariat provides a range of expertise, service and services to the member countries. So Interpol manages approximately 19 police databases with information on crimes and criminals from names and fingerprints to stolen passports, and these are accessible in real time to the Interpol member countries. Now, Interpol itself uh, offers investigative support such as forensics, analysis, and assistance in locating fugitives around the world. Training is an important part of what can be provided in many areas so that a country's government officials know how to effectively and efficiently work with Interpol services. So the expertise supports national efforts in combating crimes against three global areas that are considered the most pressing today, terrorism, cybercrime and organised crime. Now, officials working in each of these specialised crime areas run a variety of different activities alongside the member countries. This can be investigative support, field operations, training and networking. Importantly, since crimes evolve, Interpol keeps an eye on the future through research and development in international crime and trends. I'm going to give a very, very brief history lesson on Interpol. Interpol itself was conceived during the first International Criminal Police Congress in the mid 19 in the mid 20th century, so around 1914, when uh, that con Congress brought together about 24 countries um, to discuss cooperation. Now, up until that point, police and government officials didn't really interact well. It might be on a one-off basis, but it was certainly not an ongoing cooperative. Um, however, out of this Congress, um, they did lay out about 12 principles and priorities that ended up becoming the foundation of Interpol today. 
So um, at the next Congress, um, which was held in 1923, um, they formed the International Criminal Police Commission, or ICPC, which is the direct forerunner of Interpol, uh, and established a number of founding members. It wasn't until 1956 that the ICPC adopted a new constitution and adopted the new name of Interpol. So it's important as forensic scientists that we remind ourselves that Interpol is a police organisation. The forensic sciences provide input and um, uh, help provide policy and um, review, but ultimately we are consultative to the police organisation. Um, and I think sometimes forensic sciences can get caught up um, in the fact that um, we are important and we are certainly important, but like everything, we are a mere cog in the big wheel um, of how a disaster victim identification process is going to occur in a disaster. Now, the current president of the Impol is Major Ahmed Nasir al Raisi from the United Arab Emirates. Now, his role as president is part-time and it is unpaid. Um, however, um, it is stipulated that the president of Interpol must hold a full-time post within their national authority. Now, forensic odontology, uh, as many of the forensic sciences, um, is involved in its consultative capacity in the Interpol Disaster Victim Identification Committee. Um, and so the Interpol DVI Committee has its own uh, chairperson and deputy chairperson, of course. This uh, next two years, the chairperson will be Isabel Rieg from Germany and uh, the deputy chair will be Alexandra Datos from Brazil. Now, even though Alexandra appears to have a lab coat on, which is interesting, um, he is a police officer, as is Isabel. So um, they are the current uh, co uh, the head of the committee. Who makes up Interpol? So the General Secretariat, as I mentioned before, they coordinate the day-to-day -day activities to fight a range of, of crimes. The General Secretariat is run by the Secretary-General. It's staffed by both police and civilians and comprises the headquarters in Lyon, which you can see the entrance at the, uh, on the left here, and a global complex for innovation in Singapore, which is uh, this building on the right. Um, and they do have several satellite offices in different regions. Now, in each country, Interpol uh, makes contact with what we call a National Central Bureau, or NCB. Uh, it provides the central point of contact not only for the General Secretariat of Interpol, but also for other countries' NCBs. Now, an NCB is usually run by national police officials, and it usually sits in the government ministry responsible for policing. Now, the General Assembly of Interpol is the governing body, and this brings all the countries together once a year to take decisions. So we have representatives from all the countries that attend, um, and now we call that meeting the DVI conference. Now, when we talk about forensic odontology, um, many of us in forensic odontology are very aware that um, we certainly can uh, be the scientific method can, that can often deliver a qu very quick um, identification, um, uh, especially in the short term. Um, and so a lot of what uh, DVI, uh, disaster victim identification, um, many of those identifications can occur through forensic odontology. But if we go back, and it wasn't that long ago, it was only in 1968, that actually the Australian Federal Police brought to Interpol to the Interpol meeting of that year and they presented the first anti-mortem and post-mortem DVI forms. Now, they were initially developed by my state's police force, New South Wales Police Force, in response to a small aircraft accident that we had ha that had occurred in the 1960s, mid-1960s. And the interesting thing about these forms was that they did include pages that were dedicated to dental data. Um, up until that point, Interpol really didn't have anything um, in particular when it came to disaster victim identification. Um, there was nothing in place. There was no, no advice that could be given. 
And certainly it took probably another 10 years in the mid, uh, mid to late 1970s um, where a, a tanker explosion occurred in Spain affecting about 400 victims, um, uh, burn victims, of course. And as we know, in terms of incineration, forensic odontology can be immensely useful for identification purposes um, in incineration cases. Um, and Spain certainly had a lot of problem at that point trying to identify victims. It then still took probably another five years before Interpol finally decided that maybe they should put together a group um, of DVI specialists um, from some of the member countries known to have extended experience on DVI. And certainly Australia was one of the, one of the members. So this first group became the Interpol DVI working group. Now, the purpose of this working group um, was to create the Interpol internationally agreed DVI standards, guides and forms, and to propose standard operating procedures for a package of operational support that Interpol could provide to its member countries that uh, may have been affected by disasters. So the first Interpol working group on DVI included four subgroups, forensic odontology, forensic pathology, fingerprints, and police. Now, take notice here that police was one of the subworking groups. Now, I told you that Interpol is actually a police organisation. So I did find it very interesting when I was doing my research to hear that those first subgroups included a police subworking group. Back then, the chairperson of the DVI committee uh, was from the police subworking group, and then the deputy chair was from one elected from one of the three scientific subworking groups. Um, back then, too, the working group on DVI reported back to the General Assembly um, and uh, helped to, I suppose, become a steering group on DVI. So in 1984, finally, Interpol published their first DVI guide and forms. Um, and um, these forms and the guide are now revised every five years. And in actual fact, this year it's due for revision, so at the moment it is const uh, at the moment it is under review for any changes or amendments. Um, and members can certainly call on Interpol uh, to get a downloadable guide or to get downloadable forms uh, to get assistance for command and coordination, and they can even deploy an incident response team to provide on-site support. Um, in 2017. Um, they decided to uh, alternate between Leon headquarters and Singapore in terms of the uh, DVI meeting. Um, and in 20, actually a couple of years before that, um, they decided that the Interpol DVI, DVI committee would be attached to the general secretariat because it was found that reporting just once a year uh, wasn't pra as practical as they had thought. And it was better to be able to disseminate the information to the Interpol general secretariat. There was also a change at this point to the subworking groups. The police subworking group was replaced by forensic genetics. Uh, anthropology was um, added to pathology and fingerprints was renamed as radiology um, uh, because obviously we were getting uh, identifiers not only from the fingerprint. So now we have the current four subworking groups. So the four subworking groups, and I apologise, I don't know why I've left this, this um, the font in white. Um, basically, we report back to the, the DVI working group. Um, we are uh, we advise them on a number of areas, um, uh, and we help them with establishment of best practices as well. So the subworking group members are comprised, of course, of qualified experts in, um, for example, forensic odontology for our subworking group from the respective Interpol countries. So all participation is restricted to the approval of the chairperson or deputy chairperson of each specialty, as well as the DVI working group representatives and the relevant countries NCBs. So the relevant countries NCB must approve the attendance of um, uh, experts to attend the meeting. Now, certainly we can have additional experts or related persons that can participate and they can certainly attend 
the DBR conference, but they only attend in an observation capacity and they still need to be approved by their own country's NCBs for attendance. So there's a lot of information. Uh, a couple of pictures from my hometown, Sydney. You can see the Sydney Harbour Bridge up on the top here and the Sydney Opera House down on the bottom. Um, very picturesque, our Sydney Harbour. We're very proud of it. So obviously, if there are uh, any of you that are coming to Sydney, make sure that you let me know so that I can uh, show you around. Um, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt. I've see, just seen Dr. Rihawi's um, question from Syria. Um, generally speaking, Interpol, so the question was, can Interpol seek the assistance of a forensic odontologist who is not affiliated with Interpol when a disaster occurs in his country? Um, they can always seek assistance. Um, uh, if Syria is not an Interpol member country, um, Interpol can certainly work something out. But if there is a disaster, certainly the government should uh, reach out to Interpol if they certainly need assist assistance. Um, and um, certainly, uh, Wasim, as you know, we have a, uh, the Forensic Odontology Fraternity is very close. We, uh, many of us know each other. And so you should always try and reach out to your colleagues as well um, who might be able to uh, uh, speak to their government to provide assistance as well. Um, and also there are other, um, there are other groups um, such as the um, Association of Forensic Odontology for Human Rights um, that also may be able to provide assistance. But certainly reaching out to Interpol in the first instance is usually the best method. Um, and then we can always go from there. Okay, so, all right, now it doesn't want me to share. My apologies. Obviously, it doesn't like me going from one to the other. I'm going to have to stop and then I'm going to reshare. My apologies for that. Okay, let's see. Okay, beautiful. So the Forensic Odontology Subworking Group is the largest subworking group and in the Interpol, Interpol DVI Committee. Uh, its current membership is 151 members. You can see here from the chart, there is still a great proportion of membership from Europe. However, we now do have a healthy membership from the Asia region as well as uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and um, smaller memberships from some of the other regions. The current chairperson of the Forensic Odontology Subworking Group is Rudiger Lessig from Germany. Um, and as um, Professor Rakesh has already mentioned, um, I'm the current deputy chairperson elect of the Forensic Odontology Subworking Group. Um, and this is Rudiger and myself at the meeting uh, just a month ago at, uh, in Lyon. Um, uh, during one of our breaks. The subworking groups, and here you see um, uh, Professor Lessig um, reporting back to the General Assembly um, to uh, update them on what is occurring within the subworking group and update them on anything relevant um, that the members of the subworking group have raised in our um, meeting. We have a subworking group meeting that occurs um, within the uh, days of the DVI conference so that the specialty, uh, most importantly, obviously ours, the Forensic Odontology Subworking Group, uh, we have our membership come together so that we can discuss a number of items um, that uh, can certainly affect us globally. Now, of course, the purpose of the subworking groups, um, we uh, review Interpol guidelines concerning forensic odontology methodologies um, for the DVI process. We provide uh, best practices to the DVI community when it comes to forensic odontology methodologies. We review and update the anti uh, Interpol anti-mortem and post-mortem forms that are used for DVI. Um, we uh, Obviously, we're a conduit or a contact point so that we can uh, also disseminate anything that's been discussed at Interpol level back to our subgroup, subworking group members as well. And part of that is keeping our sub working group members abreast 
of um, any new practices that may be going on in the world. One of which, obviously, some of you may have attended some of my lectures already, because uh, this is an area of my expertise as well. And that is, of course, the use of CT scanning. Now, CT scanning, of course, is featuring very heavily, certainly in forensic, other areas of forensic medicine, forensic pathology. But certainly forensic odontology, uh, it is starting to play a very big role. Um, there's some of the some of our countries already have uh, at least one, if not two, uh, CT scanners for scanning deceased um, uh, persons. Uh, and certainly, I can tell you in New South Wales and in a couple of other states of Australia, um, I would say over eighty percent of our forensic identifications now um, are done using CT scans. Um, obviously, this is becoming important because we do have mobile CT scanners that can be utilised at the scene of a disaster, which means that um, human persons, deceased persons, um, can be CT scanned before they enter the temporary mortuary facility. And obviously, the advantage of this is triaging. Um, and so... Certainly, I uh, help to educate uh, my forensic odontology colleagues um, uh, about how to read CT scans for forensic, forensic odontological examinations um, because it is going to feature more and more in the identifications that we are doing. Uh, it certainly uh, became very obvious its usefulness during the last two years of COVID where many had to work remotely um, this meant that um, we could still uh, do our identifications from a remote location. But in terms of a disaster, it also means that we can uh, get the review and opinions of colleagues that may not be on site or near site of a disaster. So one of the advances um, that we talk about um, amongst our colleagues at Interpol, but also that we try and disseminate amongst our collegiate is about some of the new methods um, that are coming into practice. We also establish quality assurance guidelines and controls within forensic odontology that can be employed in the DVI setting. We provide guidance and advice um, regarding specific forensic, forensic odontological methodologies. We formulate, contribute, develop and implement the Interpol DVI strategic plan. We participate in any DVI training um, and support any key projects that Interpol has. We study and share lessons learned. Um, and I'm going to um, stop a little bit and talk about this a bit. Uh, I think for a lot of people who um, see those of us that attend Interpol, um, you know, everyone goes, oh, it's real hardship to have to travel to France. And look, I will concede that, you know, it is, especially from Australia, because they always hold the conference uh, in about June or July. So, you know, it's freezing cold in Australia. So then to go to the Northern Hemisphere and it's summer and it's lovely. Um, but part of the situation is that we are there for networking as well. Um, we have the opportunity not only to uh, have discussions with um, others in our field of study uh, or a field of specialty rather, um, but also with other forensic science colleagues. Um, as I said, um, radiology experts, um, forensic genetics experts, and of course, um, police from the different countries. Uh, not only being able to connect with police officers or, or um, superior police officers that we may not have had the opportunity to have much contact in our own country. So it's important that we are able to connect in that way, but also to be able to connect with others from other countries. Um, and this is, of course, important if a disaster should occur. Um, it is always a bit reassuring to know that you know the person that you're going to be working alongside or that you're going to work with. Um, and it's also important because um, there is a certain level of trust when you've met a person and you've dis had discussions with, a, with a, another colleague. Uh, and certainly in Australia, that um, became important when we when the Bali bombing occurred back in the early 2000s. Um, uh, whilst there was certainly a significant number of Australian citizens that were involved, um, unfortunately, with that particular disaster, 
uh, when the Indonesian government uh, invited the Australian government and uh, its scientists and officials to come and assist, we had already had a bit of a rapport, both with the police officers and the forensic scientists, um, through the networking that had occurred at Interpol. So um, it's a very powerful tool when we all come together for the Interpol DVI conference. The other thing too is that during the DVI conference, um, there are presentations that are done um, certainly within your sub-working group as well as in the uh, main General Assembly. And these presentations are basically incidents that have occurred uh, in their respective countries um, and what they did, how they planned it out, and more importantly is they go through the lessons that they learned because uh, as we are acutely aware, a disaster is uh, unplanned and it doesn't matter how well you feel your team or your country has planned for a disaster, there will always be chaos. Um, and so it's important to see from another perspective what they felt were the things that they didn't do as well as they could have. Um, because, of course, that means that all the rest of us can learn from those, um, those uh, um, areas and hopefully um, make it better in terms of our own training or our, uh, the own way that we deal with um, our disaster uh, implementation. So Interpol does get involved with international DVI responses, um, as in the 2004 Asian tsunami here. Um, this tsunami remains the largest single incident DVI operation uh, that Interpol was involved with conducted to date. Now, Professor Rakesh had already mentioned the fact that um, I am uh, probably the, one of the more experienced people in the software program that can be utilised uh, using the DVI forms. Um, that software program is called DVI Sys International. Now, it's also known as Plasdata, named after the software company, the Danish software company that actually uh, developed the program. Um, and I will mention at this point that this program was actually initially developed for Danish dentists. So the dental component or the odontology component is very good for dental, especially searching. Then what they did was they adapted it to include the Interpol DVI forms. And so they presented this whole package to Interpol, who then subsequently introduced um, the system to all its member countries. And certainly in Australia, with our uh, affiliations with the committee um, from the very beginning, we have been using DVI SIS for many, many years. Um, and um, I continue with that in terms of the current versions uh, that are in place. Now, of course, Plas Data unfortunately went into liquidation in July 2019, um, but the software and its teams were then acquired by the largest uh, Danish IT company um, uh, in, uh, called KMD. This system is the only commercially available DVI system, which is fully integrated with the DVI forms. Um, I just want to put up this statement. Many of us in forensics know this or are aware of this. The scientific subgroups exist because they are the only three ways to positively identify a human deceased. Visual uh, identification is notoriously unreliable, especially when it comes to disasters. Um, and um, uh, when you've got a family uh, who is upset and distraught and then is presented with a deceased, or in this case, in a room where there's a whole lot of deceased individuals, they may be disfigured, um, and then ask them to visually identify their um, loved ones uh, in this way, or you know, photographs up on a billboard. Um, statistics show us that only 50% of those identifications are correct. Um, so um, it is really important that we stick to our normal conventions and methodologies when it comes to the identification um, of human disease so that they go home with the correct family. Um, those of us in the forensic arena already know that someone who has deceased often looks very different from the person um, that they were in life. Uh, as I mentioned, the most recent DVI conference uh, which was held just last month in June. We only had 150 total participants approved by Interpol to attend. 25 of those 
uh, in forensic odontology and you can see our small group here. And I will add that forensic odontology is usually one of the largest subworking group attendees at these conferences, except of course, when we are capped at numbers as we were um, in this case. And I often put this up, uh, I quite like the shirt and uh, especially relevant in terms of a forensic science conference. Um, I think that um, it's uh, something that uh, often applies to what we're talking about. And I will finish off with, of course, some of the Australian marsupial animals, koala bear and the kangaroo. And I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope that it uh, gave you a little bit of insight into uh, how forensic odontology plays out in the um, in the global stage. Um, uh, and uh, if obviously, if there are any further questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask or email me. Dr. Ranjit has all my details. Um, thank you very much.